And uh, I, I changed the name of the program to Birding the Galleries. I thought, as I present this, I should be, I'm looking at the paintings, I'm looking at these images of birds as a bird watcher, not as an art critic or as a uh, humanities person, but as a bird, bird watcher. And, and, you know, birds are all around us. And for most people, birds are the most familiar form of wildlife. So it's no wonder that images of birds surround us. I was actually halfway through the first draft of this presentation before I realized the tables in our foyer back in uh, Glen Ellen pictured oriental style images of birds. And if you have wallets and you look in your wallet, you'll probably spot birds. They're on, they're on dollar bills, they're on coins. Uh, they're literally images are all around us. I started by look, trying to find depictions of birds done by cavemen, Paleolithic humans. I found a lot of sources that said that there were such images of birds, but quite frankly, I couldn't find any. In fact, the only image I found was this one, and it seems to be reproduced almost everywhere. I thought it was interesting that where the, as the bison and the rhinoceros are fairly accurately uh, depicted, the bird in the center is, is sort of a generic bird, um, a silhouette of a bird. I, I don't know what that might indicate. I know archeologists are debating among themselves what the purpose of the cave paintings were, but th this was the earliest depiction of a bird I could find. And then, I realized that one of the things I needed to do to ask myself as I looked at various images was what's the bird doing in the picture? Is it the subject of the picture as it is in this picture of a falcon by the uh, American artist, Luis Fuertes? Um, it's the bird. Is it a symbol? Does it, is it meant to represent something? Or is it a prop? And I found that there's some overlap between sometimes subject and symbol, sometimes symbol and prop. Uh, it, it depends on the painting. It depends on the time period. So the earliest real depictions of birds I could find were probably the ancient Egyptians who painted them in their tombs. Uh, you know, the Egyptians had very elaborate burial ceremonies and uh, quite often, at least in the case of the pharaohs and other people of nobility would bury them with things they thought the uh, person would need in the afterlife. The pictures of birds though, like many of the animals in Egyptian paintings are kind of remarkable. Yes, they're very abstract. Yes, they're only two dimensional, but you can identify them as to species even today. And quite often, as in here, it, it, the painting was meant to help the person in the afterlife give that person an abundance of resources. I happen to like this painting of red-breasted geese. Uh, very accurate. We're going to see this bird later on, many centuries later, in another painting. But again, you know, if this were in a field guide and you were using it, you could tell the bird in front of you was a red-breasted goose. A few centuries later, going up to Greece, the Greeks uh, depicted birds. Quite often, the most commonly depicted bird is the little owl, a European species, and it was associated with Athena. Again, it's very abstract, uh, not very lifelike, but it, it's, it does give you a sense that they were aware of, of the, this bird. It's interesting because Athena was the goddess of wisdom. One of the associ associations for owls is with wisdom. It continues to this day. The Romans also depicted birds quite often uh, as decorations. For example, here is a peacock that was found in one Roman ruin. And here's uh, another mosaic uh, from the fifth or sixth century hare hunting with hawk, or yeah. And uh, I'm not sure what species of hawk this is supposed to be, but falconry, of course, was a very popular sport 
uh, in Europe for centuries, and it shows that even the Romans had domestic, or I hate to say domesticated because the birds really aren't domesticated, but had trained hawks to hunt for them. One of the things I think you'll see this image foreshadows is something that doesn't come about so many centuries later, and that is depicting the bird engaged in some activity the bird engages in. Well, after the fall of Rome, uh, for about a thousand years, 900 years, Europe entered a period called the Dark Ages, and it was a term used by the Italian poet Petrarch around 1350. Now, many of the images of birds during this time were parts of hand letter lettered manuscripts, often religious. For example, you, you can find doves, which symbolized the Christian's Holy Spirit, frequently shown. Now, in this image from a manuscript that I was able to find, uh, yes, we know they're birds, but uh, I don't know how lifelike they are. For example, the black and white bird is probably a ma magpie. I don't know what the two black birds are over the owl. The owl itself has a rather human-looking face. So what, what I found is that the images from this period are very highly stylized or they're often copied. Uh, it suggests to me that the person forming the image, and there was usually anonymous, the person forming the image really didn't have any firsthand knowledge of birds, or if he did, it was very, very, very um, minor. This is a little bit another image uh, of a peregrine falcon with its prey from the 13th century. Uh, again, shows the bird at the, uh, engaging in natural behavior, shows the bird uh, in some detail. But uh, if you are familiar with the peregrine falcon, if you've seen pictures of them, this, the silhouette is correct, but the um, the details really wouldn't be helpful if you were relying on this to help you identify a bird. I also ran across this image and I thought it was very interesting. Like many images from the Middle Ages, Dark Ages, uh, it's religious in nature, it depicts uh, Mary and Jesus. Uh, <clears throat> I noticed a couple small indistinguishable birds in the picture, but the one that interests me is the white parrot. That's a cockatoo. That's an Australian bird. Now, this image, uh, I'm trying to see where I have my dates here. Um, <clears throat> this image is from the early 1400s, and Europeans wouldn't reach Australia until 1606. So, you know, the question remains, how did this bird end up in this painting? And it suggests trade routes and a trade in live birds. Here's another image of Mary uh, and Jesus. The bird that uh, Jesus is holding looks to be an African gray parrot, which is a commonly kept pet bird. However, the proportions are wrong. Uh, the coloration isn't quite right, right? But I found that uh, most writers on the subject agree that parrots in these kinds of paintings were supposed to symbolize happiness and joy, and that generally, when a bird is shown, it symbolizes the souls going to heaven. Uh, a friend of mine and a fellow member of the Page Birding Club, Ceremon uh, Reutrichel, found this in a museum when she was visiting in Portugal this few months ago. Something else happened in, uh, in the 1400s that's very important, I found, in how birds are depicted, and that was the printing press. And I began to recognize that there were two styles of images. Um, and the, this is my terminology. One were images created by serious fine artists, the Arts for Arts Sake group. And these would generally be painters that you might be familiar with, these would be painters you could probably see in many museums. 
and then images that were created to illustrate books. For example, <clears throat> here's a picture of a gray heron uh, by Conrad Geschner. Um, Geschner lived in the uh, 1500s. He was a Swiss doctor. He published five books about animals between 1551 and 1587. He tried very hard to separate fact from fiction. And his images was the first I could find uh, where the bird was really the subject of the uh, was of the painting. So you what was done with something like this is a wood block was carved. A wood, uh, so a, a, a wood print was made, and then someone would go back and hand color the picture of the bird. So this is Gessner's picture of a gray heron. And here I have a picture of the gray heron, which is a European bird, and it looks very similar, of course, to the great blue heron, which we see up in DuPage County, in fact, uh, some are still in the area, despite the cold. As long as there's open water, a few of them seem to hang around. So from 1350 to 1620, we enter the Renaissance. Most of us are familiar with that term. It means rebirth. And during this time, uh, Europeans uh, looked back to classical antiquity, the Greeks and Romans. They kind of saw that as the pinnacle of civilization. There was an increased awareness of nature. Uh, there was an individualistic view of man. In fact, one of the details that we take for granted now, but which was kind of revolutionary at the time, was that artists signed their name to the pictures. And painters attempted real, realistic detail. So here we have another little owl that done by uh, Dürer. Um, I'm trying to think if he was a German artist, Dutch artist. But uh, I found some interesting notes about that. He was a proponent of painting animals and uh, birds. He, he Owls, interestingly enough, had become symbols of evil and death throughout much of Europe at this time. And what's interesting about this image is the owl looks, quite frankly, a little cute, doesn't it? It's, it's almost adorable. Um, and uh, again, he's attempting very hard to depict the owl in realistic detail. He was able to do that because he was painting. He wasn't printing the image. Another 16th century painter was Arsimboldo. Uh, he was a court painter. He did what um, his boss told him to do. He's best known for rather whimsical portraits of various objects. This one I found simply called Falcon. It shows a Geyer Falcon, uh, a northern, uh, actually a bird found in the extreme north, the Arctic Circle. It's a white falcon, and it was a symbol of wealth and status. And uh, from what Researchers have found out, excuse me, this bird was part of the emperor's zoo. Notice that it's depicted, you know, very stiff portrait, uh, very plain background, uh, indicating uh, that it is a captive bird. Another interesting thing about birds at this time, Valken imagery, was that wild Valkans were symbols of evil thoughts and actions. Well, Falcons that had been trained or domesticated generally are, were thought to symbolize Gentiles who had been converted to Christianity. <clears throat> so from 1600 to roughly uh, late 1700s, Europe entered a period where the art is generally considered Baroque or Rococo. And... Uh, the Baroque period was is now considered to be a kind of a re reaction in Europe to the Protestant Reform Reformation. The Protestant Reformation uh, was very austere. Uh, quite, you know, in in Protestant churches, a lot of the uh, artwork that had been uh, part of the church when they were Roman Catholic was removed. Uh, <clears throat> this is painting is interesting. Uh, 
I found a website called the 10 most famous painting bird paintings. And this is one of them. In fact, several websites had this uh, same painting and said it was the most famous bird painting in the world. It depicts a European goldfinch, which was a popular cage bird. And you can see it here. Uh, there is some symbolism here. Goldfinches were thought to be symbols of Christ. The males have that red face, so to speak. And the, the legend was that goldfinches tried to remove the crown of thorns from Jesus's head during the crucifixion and um, got some of Jesus's blood on them. Uh, other legends said that they thorn pierced, uh, pierced the goldfinch and the goldfinch uh, had blood. But here you see a movement to depict the bird in realistic detail. And in the original painting, the bird is life size. So it's a very small bird. It's maybe four, four and a half inches long. So uh, the painting must be rather small. <clears throat> well, this painting is probably more typical of the Baroque and Rococo. Franz Snyders, who was uh, famous for his bird paintings, he calls this one Concert of Birds. And when I went online to find information about it, I discovered that he has many paintings he calls Concert of Birds. Now, in this particular painting, it's, it's interesting because the birds are generally in realistic detail. You can pick out the gray heron, the macaw. I see chaffish, hope, uh, the ho hoopo, uh, swallows, <clears throat> goldfinches, um, toucans, peacocks. You, you can recognize them, the macaw. Uh, the birds holding <clears throat> what looks like a musical score. And... Um, Notice that, that there's a bat between the hair, and I don't quite understand what that's doing there. But one of the things about this painting that's typical of its time period is it's pretty extravagant. Uh, you know, the birds are in realistic detail, uh, but I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, well, you know, what are the odds I'm gonna see all these birds together? So the, the, there is a fable um, about the owl trying to get the birds to sing in unison. And of course, you can imagine what a cacophony, a group of birds like this would be. Uh, maybe it's a, not to symbolize uh, a foolish endeavor. Now, some of you might not like this particular picture. Another one by Schneiders. It's a, it's a, still life, which are very common. And uh, <clears throat> quite often patrons would ask painters to uh, do paintings like this. This certainly shows the painter's skill in depicting uh, objects in, in different light. Uh, you have here, for example, the, the peacock. Uh, I'm not sure what that larger bird is. I see a ring neck pheasant, which is an, actually a Chinese bird, but has been imported all over the world as a game bird. You see a couple deer, you see the lobster, you see the uh, flowers. It suggests the wealth and status of the uh, patron. And again, very extravagant. This was one of the more interesting period paintings I found from the period by Jan Asselin, uh, a Dutch painter. It shows a mute swan, and we're familiar with mute swans in DuPage County because a lot of corporate campuses literally rent pairs of these birds for the spring and summer because they supposedly keep Canada geese off the property. In this picture, it took me a while uh, to notice that in the lower left-hand corner, you see the muzzle of a dog, and the swan very dramatically is defending its nest back there. Also, and you could barely see it, there's an inscription slightly above the dog's head in the lower left that leads some people to believe that the swan here is meant to uh, uh, represent a Dutch patriot who was uh, very avid in defending 
uh, the Netherlands from its various enemies. Other critics say that the inscription was po probably added later. But again, this is a very contorted looking bird. Um, and I, I, we're going to be talking about swans in other contexts, but uh, generally they were seen as symbols of love and peace they made for life, but they can be quite aggressive. And yet again, another um, painting called The Floating Feather. This one is interesting. And by now you've probably picked up the pattern. Many of these paintings depict birds in very realistic detail. Here we have uh, a number of aquatic birds shown in a setting. And during this time, uh, nobility and wealthy people in general were fond of having their own mini zoos and mini aviaries. These were all exotic species to Europe. And if you look kind of bottom center, you'll see that red-breasted goose that we saw back with the Egyptians. I did find one explanation for the title of this, and I don't quite understand why it, <laughs> I, I don't understand why it, it's the dominant thing here, but if you look very carefully at the bottom, bottom right, you'll see a little feather that looks to be floating on the water. But otherwise, this is in a park-like setting, um, an attractive painting, as typical of the time period, there's dramatic use of light and dark. And uh, <clears throat> I should say that this was again considered a, a, one of the paintings I found on the 10 Famous Paintings website. Uh, and incidentally, many of these pictures uh, I discovered are for sale. If you go, if you enter like bird images or something and you, you go online, you'll find that various galleries and Etsy have these paintings uh, for sale, a few prints of them if you want, it, if you want one. <clears throat> By the close of the 17th century, exploration, European ex exploration of the rest of the world really began to develop. And engraving replaced the woodcuts. It allowed finer detail, although the basic idea was the same. An image in black and white was printed, and then someone went back and hand colored it. These illustrations are very different from the style seen in the still life paintings. They were also very important because at this time, most expeditions would have someone uh, on the expedition whose job it was to collect specimens of plants and animals. And especially in the animal specimens, quite often wouldn't survive the trip. And um, so what, what was done was that an artist would paint them. George Edwards is considered the father of British ornithology, and he published seven volumes depicting birds. Ironically, none of the birds in his books are British. At the time, his paintings were praised for what was considered lifelike postures of the birds. But again, this looks like a very posed picture of a bird. Another painting of the time was by William Hayes. He's very typical of the audience, uh, artist at the time who painted pictures of birds for wealthy clients, quite often people who had these birds in their personal collection. <clears throat> Another important uh, student of birds at this time was John Latham. He was one of the founders of the Linnaean Society of London, which is a group dedicated to the study of natural history. It's still in existence. He's responsible for most of the English names that were given to Australian birds. And he wrote and illustrated a book called A General Synopsis of Birds. 
And at the, by this point, you're noticing again, lifelike detail. Uh, you can identify the bird from the painting, the setting, very stark. Now, the 18th century is also called the Age of Reason. And it was at a time when there was a rejection of medieval ideas. It was also almost a rejection of certain classical ideas. During the Renaissance, uh, authors would quote Aristotle and other authorities, uh, classical writers. And during the Age of Reason, writers began to uh, based what they say on their own observations or what they were told by people. A style known as neoclassicism be, uh, began to be popular in the art world. It was very uh, simple and sy symmetric. It, it was a rejection of what they considered the Rococo style. And most of the subjects, however, were taken from classical literature or contemporary subjects in a classical setting. So you might have a picture of, uh, of a, a, a nobleman, but he be, appear, be, appear to be in the armor of a Roman. Now, if a bird appears in a painting at, at from this time, as opposed to something in a book, it's usually part of the setting, not the subject of the painting. And I found this one very, this painting very interesting. It's called Experiment with the Air Pump. Um, the bird is in that glass container top center of the picture. What I found interesting is the 18th century was a time of a lot of citizen scientists, uh, especially in the area of natural history. I find it interesting to look at the various actions. Uh, at the very least, on the right side, the man explaining to the woman what's going on, and the woman turns her head away. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the other interesting figure for me in this picture is the gentleman in the lower right, who seems lost in thought. But this shows the 18th century's fascination with science and experiments. The bird here, of course, can't tell as to species, it's simply a prop in the picture. The next period in art was one that I was looking for a lot of bird paintings. First of all, it was the Romantic period and the Romantics believed in the barriers of separating one part of nature from another were artificial. And we'll, as we'll see, Audubon's birds were part of a larger scene. The Romantics believed that humans were part of nature, and Audubon's birds were depicted engaged in what one critic called a moral dilemma, attacked or being attacked. And one idea that we'll see was that man was seen as a part of nature, and the idea of the noble savage began to emerge. So this is a, a 19th century romantic picture painting, The Tree of Crows. Um, it's depicting, meant to depict the kind of the desolation at the onset of winter. Yes, you can see small black birds in it, but they're really props, I think. Uh, they're not very detailed. In fact, they don't look very crow-like to me, but there's a lot of, uh, I think what the Germans call German drang. It's, it's, tense it's a lot of tension in it and uh, although they glorify the romantics glorified nature the serious artists of the time as far as i can tell had very few if any bird paintings in this uh, as the subject of their painting what was popular among the romantics especially in the united states were landscape paintings. And we're in the United States, we have what's called the Hudson River School. Uh, this is a painting depicting the uh, painter Thomas Cole and poet William Cullen Bryant, whose poem, Thanatopsis, A View of Death, was in every junior American literature book I ever ran across. In fact, there's paintings in most of them. 
And <clears throat> here you have a very dramatic picture from the Hudson River Valley. Birds are in this picture, but again, they're props, they're part of the scenery. I, I see one in the distance and uh, there's one against the cliff. What kind of bird they are, we can't tell. This was Cole's greatest painting, um, the oxbow, he called it. It's quite a large painting. It's, uh, I have the dimensions here. It, it was four and a half by over six feet. So it's quite a large painting. Uh, depicting a natural scene, a storm moving in. And I wonder to what degree the American painters were influenced by John Ruskin, a British critic who wrote uh, quite a number of books about the arts. And basically he said the best subject for a, a painting would be a landscape with mountains and rivers and clouds. And there are a number of paintings like this. I thought this one was kind of interesting. It's by a British painter because it shows uh, a landscape, but it's not a wild landscape. In the distance, you can see buildings, you can see the farmers in the foreground. But Ruskin's quote uh, stuck with me. Nature is painting for us day after day pictures of infinite beauty if only we have the eyes to see them. Well, in the world of books, in the world of books, quite a lot was happening. Yes, there was a seeming indifference towards the uh, birds in the works of art of many of the conventional or arts for art's sake artists, but bird flirt paintings began to flourish in the late 18th century and throughout the 19th century. This painting of a roseate spoonbill, which is a bird I see down here in Florida by Audubon, uh, is considered one of his greatest paintings. And uh, <clears throat> it shows a bird in lifelike detail. It shows it in a natural setting. But I discovered something I hadn't uh, known, that quite often Audubon was responsible for the bird in the fore foreground and whatever the background is, that was added by apprentices in the various um, print shops that were printing Audubon's works. The actual book, Birds of America, has 435 life-size prints. And I put it down so you can see how large these books were. They measured almost 40 inches by over uh, 24 inches. Currently, there's 120 copies. Uh, I did a little research. The last one I could find being sold was in 2000 for $8.8 .8 million. So, uh, you know, if anybody wants to know what to get me for my birthday, I'm, it's, I'm just saying. However, Audubon wasn't alone, nor he was the first. He was part of a tradition of artists illustrating books about birds. And I'm going to look at some of them just so you can see uh, the differences between them. Again, I discovered that many of these images are available as prints. So at Eliezer Album's Natural History of Birds uh, was thought to be the first book featuring hand-colored illustrations of British birds. And I chose to pick, uh, show you a good old North American cardinal. Uh, Part of the interest in birds, was in, in Great Britain at least, was because the birds from the, the colonies and the New World were so exotic to them. And we're going to be looking at uh, a number of other paintings by uh, different artists, so you can see the different styles. Now, before I, I go on, Album, here's a, a picture from his book, A Natural History of Birds. I found a great website, archives.org, where it's possible to find, uh, I guess there's scans of these books that you probably aren't gonna be able to find in the library. Here's a picture of a European jay. The color and pattern are very accurate, but the bird's proportions, uh, the, they're wrong. Uh, 
to give you an idea, a real European J would look like our American blue J without the crest. Now you might want to know, <clears throat> ask yourself as I did, what's the difference between a painting and an illustration? The contemporaries of Audubon dismissed him as an illustrator. And as I've been using the term, paintings were intended to stand alone, arts for art's sakes. Illustrations were meant to clarify or elaborate, elaborate on words. Uh, but as you'll find, these illustrations quite often resulted in very lifelike, very uh, beautiful images of birds. And something else happened to help the process. In the first half of the 19th century, a process called lithography replaced etching. And I've tried to understand lithography. It seems as though it's basically literally uh, taking a flat surface, first at first a stone, and by using uh, uh, assets and oils, uh, blocking off areas so that ink can go into other areas. And the process was the same then, though, as in the past. An image would be printed, and someone would then go back and hand color the image. So one predecessor of Audubon's was John Latham. And here's another example of his work. A lot of the scientists, or at least the people who wrote about birds at this time, really were amateurs, or we'd call them citizen scientists. Latham was a doctor. He made a lot of money at being a doctor. And he retired and set about to illustrate every bird known to science and he was able to publish a book in 1781. Unfortunately, he exhausted his fortune by doing that. Sidney Parkinson was one of the um, <clears throat> illustrators who accompanied uh, some, uh, someone on their voyage, their ex exploration voyage, and he accompanied Captain James Cook on Cook's 1768 voyage. He drew and painted animals and collected them during the voyage, uh, largely because they couldn't su uh, survive the voyage. Sadly, neither did uh, Parker. He died shortly after uh, Cook left Australia, what is now Australia. This particular bird, though, the coal tit, is a native British bird. <laughs> And I'm looking at this thinking this, again, I can identify the bird, but it looks very posed to me. It doesn't look natural at all. William Barton, Bartram, uh, is a native born American who strangely enough influenced the British. They came over here and visited with him and he helped them <coughs> with collecting specimens. He himself collected 14 specimens of American birds which other scientists use. This is a purple finch. It's a bird we sometimes see in Chicago in the uh, winter, early spring. It's not very lifelike. The colors, the colors are wrong. Uh, if you have house finches coming to your bird feeder, a purple finch looks a lot like a house finch, only it's uh, a purple, more purple color. Mark Catesby was a British um, artist. He came to the United Colony several times in the uh, early 1700s. And when he returned to England, he wrote a book about the natural history. He called the Natural History of Carolina, Florida, and the Bahama Islands. Notice this bird. It's interesting. He called it the red-winged starling. Of course, we know it as the red-winged blackbird. I want to mention Alexander Wilson. I, I know a lot of my birdwatching friends aren't as familiar with Wilson as I think they ought to be. He published uh, a number of works about American birds. He's considered the father of American ornithology. And um, in fact, there's a, still the Wilson Society and the Wilson Bulletin, which are uh, major 
ornithological journals, uh, not bird watching, ornithological. Here you can see his roseate spoonbill. Uh, again, this is basically to help give readers a sense of the appearance of the bird. But Audubon's always held up as an example of an artist, and the work of artists from Audubon forward reflect the concern for lifelike detail. Uh, <clears throat> Audubon's uh, audiences today really appreciate his works as artwork, and a critic, Ron Tyler, has written, Audubon is seldom considered in the context of his painterly con contemporaries, and has never been properly recognized as one of the great American romantic artists. Which is different because George Catlin, who is contemporary of Audubon, is often considered a romantic uh, painter. He was part of the whole movement uh, of depicting things seen in the American West, and especially of Native Americans. And, the paintings, as he has here, of uh, a Native American were considered as colorful and exotic as Audubon's birds. I wanted to see if I could find any bird paintings to compare. I couldn't, but I found these two. Catlin's painting of a buffalo and Audubon's painting of bison. And as I look at them, uh, Catlin's buffalo, quite frankly, looks a little cross-eyed. If I didn't know anything about bison, I could learn a lot from Audubon's painting. I have a good idea of what the uh, habitat looked like. I could see that they occur in herds. I could see the difference between the bull, the cow, and the calf. It's uh, a much more detailed, much more uh, engaging, I think, painting. <clears throat> I'm going to hurry up a little bit here. Uh, the 19th century saw the emergence of an art form called realism. This painting, uh, heron women feeding pigeons in a courtyard, is considered one of the great bird paintings of the time. I'm not so sure I'd recognize those birds as pigeons, maybe one or two of them, uh, although the behavior is typically pigeon-like. It was a form of painting meant to appeal to the ordinary person. But again, in books, a whole different sort of thing was happening. Uh, and bird depictions of birds were much, much more realistic. And a number of uh, outstanding bird painters uh, occurred during this time. Generally, you're going to find the bird images are very detailed, very lifelike. Here's one uh, by Edward Lear, who was had quite a mass appeal. Prints of his paintings or his illustrations sold widely. He was preceded by Thomas Buick, who we actually have some birds in uh, North America named after Buick, who reverted to woodcuts, but he was much more craftsmanlike. And here you have a very detailed picture of a European blackbird, which is actually closely related to our crow. I'm sorry, our Robin, and you can see it in a very detailed setting. One of the most famous bird painters of the time was John Gould, uh, who was a, more of a scientist than our artist. He made sketches of birds, such as this sketch he did of toucans, and then the, he gave the sketches to various people, including his wife Elizabeth and Edward Lear, who would then make detailed paintings, and these uh, became prints that were widely published. Another thing associated with Gould, there were uh, fads in the 19th century. One fad involved hummingbirds because they were very exotic. Another fad, fad involved birds of paradise for the same reason, they were very exotic. And middle-class uh, People would buy these paintings and uh, prints of these paintings, I should say, and put them up in their homes. Here's one of golden pheasants. It's an Asian bird that's uh, widely kept in various parts of Europe. I don't think it's uh, <clears throat> feral, but uh, they are kept. Jo Joseph Wolf was a German. He moved to England. He worked for the 
British Museum. He illustrated the works of many explorers. You might have heard of David Livingston, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, and Henry Walter Bates. And he's considered a, a pioneer in wildlife art. Notice that we see the male and female pheasant. We see the habitat. We see another pheasant in the background. Kuhlsman's was output apparently was very large. And what I could find out is that most serious British works uh, featured his paintings. And he was dismissed though, because the uh, critics said his paintings were accurate, but lifeless. And uh, those are his oil paintings and collectors apparently appreciate his um, watercolors more. What's interesting about the man, this picture of the uh, magpie is you have a, what looks to be a weasel with a prey and the magpie looks like it's ready to scavenge the prey from the weasel. <clears throat> By the 1890s, these lavish hand-colored bird books were a publishing rarity, but Heinrich Grosswold uh, was is considered the last to produce such works. By this time, the letterpress and three-color letterpress printing had come into being, and so many of his books, uh, his print, uh, paintings, I should say, and prints were being reproduced in books in that way. Thorburn uh, admired Wolf, and actually, I thought this was interesting. Wolf had been criticized for being too artistic. Thorburn uh, defended him. Now, these are very complex paintings, I think. We have the bullfinches, and we have the ring-necked pheasants. The, the background detail is very, very complex. Thorburn is typical of a number of painters at this time who like pick painting pictures of game birds. For example, Henry Edward Lodge uh, was really passionate about hunting and hunting with hawks. And he liked birds, but he liked to hunt them also. And towards the very end of the period, we have Tunnicliffe, who is considered uh, one of the greatest British uh, bird painters. I thought it was interesting. I read that he would go out for walks and ride his bike. And when he came across a dead bird, he collected it and he used the corpses as models. I'm going <clears throat> Gerhard Heilmann's name came up in a book I was reading about the history of ornithology. Uh, basically, he's, he's a paleontologist and he wrote a book, The Origin of Birds in 1926. May, this is Archaeopteryx, uh, which is considered maybe one of the first birds. Um, <clears throat> he looked at the uh, skeletons of fossils they were finding and uh, came up with this illustration. He also did a few paintings of um, living birds. Well, by the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, we get into the... Uh, <clears throat> Impressionists and the Impressionists liked to paint outdoors. Uh, they liked uh, to using light, but again, I found very few paintings that had birds in them. And usually, as as you can see here, a prop. This is Mary Cassatt, an American living in Paris, a drawing she did of a woman with a parrot. Monet had uh, included some birds, but you can see the Impressionists preoccupation with using light. So uh, light and shadow. And again, uh, <clears throat> yes, we could probably tell these are domestic turkeys. Here we have a still life that done by Bonet. Uh, I, I hesitate to say the birds are the subject of the painting. Uh, I, you know, it, it shows his skill as an artist in depicting light and dark. This is considered one of his best bird paintings, the magpie. And when I found this painting, The Way a Bird Sings, if you want to see the bird, it's in the left, it's black and white. Uh, <clears throat> again, an impressionist, not very uh, detailed. 
what's interesting i think about the magpie in this painting is it does draw your eye because the black and white is kind of a stark contrast to everything else another french painter is renoir who's famous for his painting of women and again in both of these you learn a lot about uh maybe the woman you the girl they both have birds uh it looks like a parrot in both cases but it's it suggests something about uh, the models not a whole lot about the bird van gogh of course subject into himself this is probably the best painting by an impressionist of a bird i could find the green kingfisher um not really realistic detail, but if you know the bird, it is a good impression of the bird. Well, we're going on to the 20th century, and I want to reveal my bias. So if you take a moment and look at this cartoon. And this cartoon. And here's a painting by Cezanne, not birds at all, typical of his style. We go into the, here's a painting by Henry Rousseau. It's called The Flamingos. If you look in the lower right corner, you can see flamingos. Uh, Rousseau, I'm sorry, uh, Rousseau was praised uh, for his primitive and naive style. Art critics considered this particular painting one of the greatest works of the art of the early 1900s. Uh, I'll let you decide for yourself. I, uh, as a bird watcher, I see flamingos. I learned that they're found in tropical countries. I learned they're found by water, but proportions are wrong. I mean, I, <clears throat> this painting doesn't do a lot for me, but like I said, it's considered one of the great ones. Even more abstract is this one by Paul Klee in what's considered the expressionist style. Uh, he worked through a number of uh, art movements. This is considered nature in its purest form, according to one critic. In the whole image, and I only have parts of the images here, uh, I think there's six little yellow objects that, you know, they're birds, but what kind of bird? Who knows? I had to include Frida Kahlo. Uh, my wife and I are associated with College of DuPage, and two years ago, uh, the Art Center had a Frida Kahlo exhibit. Frida Kahlo's uh, paintings were generally about herself, but she often included animals. And she, she, from her writings, from what she told people, we know that she found a lot of comfort in her various pets. And so the birds uh, are depicted very lovingly they're not the subject but it does suggest the comfort she found from the birds i happen to like georgia o'keith uh but this is very different from the o'keith paintings i found it, i i'm told it's a style called precisionism where things are reduced to their just very most basic form so you have an object that looks like a bird most of us who grew we're around in the 60s and 70s are familiar with Picasso's piece stuff, but I found a couple of bird paintings. Again, uh, pigeons, bird on a tree, no attempt made at realism, uh, interesting use of color and shape, but uh, especially the one on the right, bird on a tree, I'm told is an example of what's called cubism. Okay, I mentioned College DuPage. This summer, College DuPage at the Mackinac Art Center is going to have a Andy Warhol exhibit. And I did not know this, but Andy Warhol, the pop artist, was also very interested in the environment. And in 1987, released a series of prints of endangered animals. Uh, you can see the bald eagle here. Uh, the original painting was very lifelike. Uh, but then he comes in and he does the Andy Warhol thing to it. But again, you know, artists do, you know, contemporary artists do look at birds. Uh, I'm interested in if, if they see the bird as the subject or if it's meant to represent something. <clears throat> I 
Well, I talking a lot about COD and I got to mention Tony Fitzpatrick, who's a Chicago artist, graduate of COD. He's been called the apostle of Humboldt Park. And he often has birds and other kinds of wildlife depicted in a very urban setting. Now, many of the paintings I've showed you, uh, I went online and I clipped the painting. This is on a, from a photograph I've actually taken if, in downtown Glen Ellen on the uh, east side of Main Street, a couple blocks north of the railroad tracks. There are a couple Fitzpatrick murals, and this one is quite large. It's uh, it, typical of the paint, this kind of painting for him. He shows very, very Chicago kinds of scenes going on, and in the middle of the scene, he has a bird. Uh, one critic admires Fitzpatrick because he brings together what he says, nature and culture. He did say in an interview that he did turn to nature during the pandemic. It was a source of tranquility. This is a very bird-like looking bird, but I'm at a loss to name the species. <laughs> the Audubon tradition in uh, bird painting, though, does continue. And I'm going to show you some examples. Um, first is by Luis Fuertes. He, his bird paintings illustrated a number of books in the uh, 20th century. This one of a male belted kingfisher. In the Audubon tradition, the birds in lifelike detail, it's shown engaged in natural uh, behavior. The setting's not too detailed. Owen Grammy was the curator of birds at the uh, Milwaukee Public Museum. And I have a kind of a connection to him. Uh, I was introduced to him when I was 15 and too young to appreciate whom I was being introduced to. His son, uh, Roy, taught biology at the high school I attended. This is a painting of trumpeter swans, and you can see the birds <clears throat> are shown in, in lifelike detail in a very natural setting, and you quite often see them in small flocks. Roger Torrey Peterson, of course, is very famous for his bird, bird guides. Excuse me a moment. <clears throat> But his, his field guide illustrations are a little more diagrammatic than his paintings. And he has said in a number of interviews, he, wants to be, he wanted to be remembered as a painter. He didn't want to be remembered as the author of the field guides, especially. So this is a wood thrush, very lifelike detail. Uh, I got to confess, the background isn't perhaps the most detailed, but it does show the bird in a natural environment. Dennis Kania is a member of the DuPage Birding Club, and Dennis has traveled to the world leading trips and taking photographs, and he paints the birds, many of the exotic birds he sees. These are crown cane, cranes he saw in Africa. I, they are seen in flocks like this. He's painted them from many different perspectives, so you can appreciate the plumage and uh, the various poses they adopt. I want to mention uh, Ridgeway, who was born in Mar Mount Carmel, Illinois. Uh, <clears throat> his bird paintings are uh, good. Uh, they're not the most detailed and not the most famous, but he's been important because he systemized color, na color names, especially those used for birds and other animals, but also in de uh, decorative arts. Uh, so I came up with some criteria that I was using to judge bird pictures. And I'm going to show you a series, and I'll let you decide which ones you like best. You know, my, my criteria were this. The bird's the subject of the painting. The image is in, rendered in realistic, fine detail. The bird's in a natural environment, and a bird is engaged in typical behavior. So here's a photograph I took a year or so ago of a blue jay gathering acorns. Uh, the photograph meets all those criteria. Now we're going to look at some bird, blue jay paintings. Here's the blue jay by Mark Catesby. Remember, he's the uh, uh, 18th century British botanist who came to the United States and uh, studied American wildlife and plants. 
Here's John James Audubon's painting. Here's Fuerte's painting. Here's Grammy's painting. Finally, Peterson's painting. One area where bird art uh, is thriving was started in 1935 by Ding Darling, and that was the duck stamps that uh, duck hunters need to buy uh, federal duck stamp to hunt ducks. And many birders I know go out and buy these stamps because the money the Fish and Wildlife Service raises this way uh, supports habitat, the buying habitat and maintaining habitat. <clears throat> So each year, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service holds a competition. The, the service prescribes the species to be depicted. So this year, toward 2023, artists are invited to submit paintings of snow goose, black duck, pintail, ringneck duck, and harlequin duck. And these are some paintings from uh, the previous year. So we... Widgeon and teal. I think that's supposed to be a that's a trumpeter swan. This was the painting that won uh, Joseph Houtman's painting of trumpeter swans. Remember, Gromney had a painting. You saw that again. He's showing the birds in a natural environment, lifelike detail. Uh, <clears throat> the Houtman, Joe Joe Houtman's kind of interesting. Oh, before I go on. So this is a photograph I took last October in Glen Ellen. A uh, flock of, I think, five or six trumpeter swans landed at Lambert Lake. Um, and I was able to get over there and photograph them. They stayed a few days. Incidentally, if you go to eBird, uh, that's eBird.org, and you hit Explore, uh, you're going to find that trumpeter swans have been seen for the past several months in, throughout the Chicago area, never in large numbers, but in DuPage, Cook, and Kane County. So Joe Houtman is one of the three Houtman brothers from Minnesota. And uh, I think uh, the subtitle explains it all. They have won 15 competitions and going on. They're the subject of several movies. I learned about them. Uh, watching a CBS Sunday morning show. And <clears throat> they each have their distinct style. I'm gonna this is Wood Duck by Jim Houtman. Now, I, I need to apologize for some of these pictures because it's uh, some of them are pixelated. What I did was try to find things online and clip and paste them. Sometimes it worked well sometimes not so well. But here you have uh, a typical kind of wood duck scene, especially in the fall. You'll have several males, they're in their breeding plumage. You have a female perched on a log by a pond. Joe Houtman's picture is very detailed of a male wood duck, which we have in DuPage County. I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen them. And this is Bob Houtman's painting. So I'm still in the process of trying to formulate what I think about all this. So what I've learned is that these represent, representations range from realistic to abstract. Historically, these birds have been very symbolic. Uh, in the fine arts, arts for art's sake, uh, depictions of birds generally reflect what were contemporary artistic styles and trends. And artists have explored a uh, number of media as the 
way of reproducing an image has improved, so have the images themselves. So it's made possible finer, more lifelike detail. So I just want to thank you now for allowing me to share. And I'll, I see I have a couple questions I'll, I'm going to try to answer. Okay, uh, Julie tells me there's a cave that has a wonderful owl. And Julie is also uh, enjoyed seeing the pictures by Edward Lear. Well, I'm good. Chris, I'm glad you found it informative. I, I have to confess, I'm starting out with this. I uh, There is a course class being offered at COD. I unfortunately can't even sit in on it because uh, I'm in Florida and it's in Glen Ellen. But uh, <clears throat> one of the art teachers at COD is teaching a course on birds and art, nature and art. And he's looking at very contemporary art. Uh, and as you can tell, I, I am puzzled by contemporary art when it comes to pictures of nature. Uh, uh, you know, Tony Fitzpatrick, I, I, I get what he's aiming at. Uh, but if I had to live with a <clears throat> bird painting over my, in my study, I think I'd choose one of the Hauptman brothers over Tony's. So George? Okay. Are there any other questions? No? Oh, I got, here's number four, come up. Let's see what this says. Okay, thank you, Deborah. Uh, John, that was very, very interesting. I really do appreciate you uh, taking the time uh, there in Florida and um, presenting this program. I just wanna let everyone know, uh, we did record the program and, um, it will be available on the library's YouTube channel. Um, it looks like Cindy uh, is mentioning that uh, I'm looking in the Q&A box. She spent 12 years of her younger life living in Audubon, Pennsylvania, <laughs> the hometown of Audubon's uh, Mill Grove. Great, but she prefers Audubon, so. I'll, I'll tell you something I found out that I thought was interesting. Uh, Alexander Wilson, who published his book before Audubon's, actually met Audubon in Kentucky and tried to get him to subscribe to the book. Audubon wouldn't do it, but a friend of Audubon's was there and said something to, an, to Audubon in French uh, to the effect that Audubon's paintings were better than Wilson's, and so that inspired Audubon to go out and try publishing his own book. Uh, as you can imagine, these books were, were very, very expensive because, again, the, every image was hand-colored. And uh, uh, <clears throat> so to this day, I, you know, to see a real Audubon print is, is something. I, I, I know I've seen some, uh, not quite sure where, in an art gallery, but, you know, reproductions of almost everything I showed tonight are available if someone wants to go online and mm -hmm. purchase it. Uh, I did find it was hard, George, since you're a librarian, it was hard for me to find books on the subject. And the irony was that I got, I got one book on Birds of Paradise that Glen Ellen Library loaned from another library. And when I went back to try to find uh, find out what the author and title was. I hadn't paid, it was just about Birds of Paradise. And I didn't pay it that much attention at the time. I couldn't find it. It's real, if you go online and put bird paintings in as a search term, you're going to go immediately to sites that want to sell you paintings. So, but it, it, it has been interesting and I'm going to continue investigating this. I have uh, another program I'm working on that deals most mostly with birds and language and pop culture. So I have Woody Woodpecker and Woodstock and uh, other things involved in that too. Great. Well, we hope to have you back soon. Um, okay. Thanks, your programs Brian. are always very interesting. Well, I hope, I hope everyone stays warm and safe up north. I, I know it's, it's getting cold. I have a son still up there who's looking after the house and uh, 
we were gone. Second or third day we were gone, get a phone call. He had to go out and shovel. So I felt sorry for him. I wasn't there to supervise. Well, I'm going to tell you this, John. Uh, I noticed in the last two days the uh, the Canada geese are starting to fly north again. So spring is in the air. <laughs> I, I know it. I, you know, I, I will tell you, for people who sometimes seem jealous that I'm down here in Florida, I, I did some mental, I did some math, and almost 80 percent of the birds I see here in Florida, I see up in DuPage County. 80 percent. Um, so uh, DuPage County has a lot to offer. Absolutely. Well, thank well, you thank very you. much, John. Well, thank you. It's been you a pleasure. Care. Hope to hear from you soon. Bye. Take care.